Is a liberated Palestine a threat to Jews? Does calling for the liberation of Palestine mean that you're against Jews? No one's been as vociferous in condemning this propaganda more than the Jewish people themselves who have been coming out in droves saying not in our name concerning the war crimes in Gaza over the last few weeks as well as those who are challenging the racist framing of Palestinian freedom being anti-Semitic. They march with us. They hold their own specific demonstrations inside and outside of Palestine too. Sheikh Abu Osama al dhahbi in fact, the other day sent this video of an Orthodox Jewish man in the airport prayer room. As I was showing you the multi-faith room, his Jewish guy came up to me, was holding this. I read it. And I said, you want to take a picture? I said, yeah, I'll take a picture. But there are some people who are trying to muddy the waters and trying to equate Israel with Jews, particularly in some Western countries. Many right-wing people project their own hatred of Jews or anti-Semitic guilt onto others, obsessed with highlighting Jewish that the Palestinians just don't like Jews, when precisely the opposite is the case. They're not bothered with the claimed ethnicity or identity of Israelis. If it was Mexicans or Japanese or Eskimos who came out of their igloos and expelled them from their homes and colonized their lands, they still wouldn't be okay with it. As one prominent Jewish activist put it, there is a concerted effort to imply that Palestinians demanding political and civil rights are doing so because they want to see Jews annihilated. Although this is a narrative that has tricked many people, upon simple scrutiny, not only does this narrative unravel, it's actually the opposite impression that emerges, that the downfall of the Zionist occupation would actually be good for Jews. Let's examine a few inconvenient facts for Zionism. Number one, Israel is bad news for Jews. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to do that illegal occupation, racial apartheid systems, settler colonialism and general violent ethno-nationalism in your name is not good for your long-term prosperity. Even those Jews inside Israel that commit the crime of humanizing Palestinians are treated terribly by both the state and violent settler colonists from abroad who often carry out their violent rampages with impunity. During the ancient olive harvesting tradition, for example, Israeli Jews and international activists come to support and protect Palestinian farmers from settler violence, often getting lynched themselves. Hagar Geffen, for example, a 70-year-old Jewish activist, was beaten up by a group of settlers who punctured her lungs and broke her ribs. A 70-year-old lady. Another dark example of this inconvenient fact can be seen in this stomach-churning documentary on the Hannibal Directive of the Israeli Occupation Forces, which in effect states a dead Israeli is better than a captured one. Although they claim to have retired this doctrine in 2016, after three decades of carnage, the recent first-hand testimonies and recordings of Israeli prisoners taken captive by the Gazan resistance has reignited this debate amongst Israelis, since the prisoners said that the Israeli occupation forces themselves opened fire into crowds of Israeli prisoners to stop them being taken to Gaza, as this freed prisoner recounts from the events of 7th October. This is because the continuation of an ethno-nationalist project requires a separation and dehumanization of the otherized Palestinians. The Israeli fighter Gilad Shalit, when he was taken prisoner in Gaza for several years, it was a huge embarrassment for the Zionist regime. Because not only was he swapped for a record number of 1,027 Palestinian hostages held by Israel, but he came out of Gaza effectively de-radicalized with an empathy for Palestinians and wanting peace. This is a poison for the continuity of the apartheid system because it requires fear and othering to persist. As Ilana Hammerman, a senior Israeli writer and columnist for the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, herself states, Israeli society has a really big problem coping with reality. It's a society that lives under a deep sense of persecution and fear that are clearly used to brainwash people. Inconvenient fact number two, just look at the types of people that offer support to Israel. It's the rising scourge of far-right populism and ethno-nationalism across Western nations and the ethno-nationalist Hindutva mobs of India too, obsessed with caste and race, who are now in power and reportedly linked to our own Prime Minister's in-laws, but that's another story. Some of the biggest Zionists in the world are far-right Christian fundamentalists in the US, for example, who want to see Jews shipped off to Israel. This is why Zionism itself is described as anti-Semitic by some Jews. Elad Daniel Perig writes, Zionism effectively concurs with the basic tenets of anti-Semitism, that Jews do not belong in the world. It's important to reflect on the fact that although the entire world has been calling for the Zionist occupation to come to the negotiating table for decades and Palestinian group after Palestinian group has tried as well, peaceful means, violent means, democratic means, non-democratic means, armed resistance, non-violent resistance, 
you name it. But regarding those governments who have offered Israel unconditional support, Professor Joseph Massad writes, it is hardly a coincidence that these countries are either settler colonies themselves or colonizing countries who had established white supremacist settler colonies, Namibia, Rhodesia, South Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, and Kenya to name a few, which they fought to uphold with much violence from the 1890s to the 1980s, when indigenous resistance finally upended them. As Israel is the last settler colony in Asia or Africa that continues to be ruled by racist laws and institutions, the West views its survival as Europe and the US's last stand in support of racism and settler colonialism outside their borders and against the barbaric hordes of the non-Europeans resisting colonial rule and determined to overthrow it. So Israel is bad for Jews. Many people who hate Jews love Israel. Many Israelis themselves know that they cannot have a lasting peace if it is at the expense of the illegal occupation, annexation, settler colonialism and general racism against others. But as many Jews are increasingly arguing, peaceful and humane dismantling of the Zionist state of Israel is possible, just like the previous colonial regimes and apartheid were formally abolished. However, many Jews might genuinely be fearful for what would happen to them. I asked Islamic scholar and historian Sheikh Dr. Uthman Latif, an expert on the history and the virtues of Al-Quds, Jerusalem. Should Jews be afraid of a liberated Palestine? Yeah, liberated I think it's Palestine. important question. Sometimes people forget when it concerns, because I think that there are some fears that uh, I think I've, I've kind of had a floating on social media about the fact that if they, if they liberate Palestine, that doesn't mean the subjugation of any people. It means the thriving and liberation of all communities. And people forget, in fact, that the fact that Muslims were very pivotal in saving the lives of Jews in the most difficult moments in their histories. For example, in a Spanish Inquisition, I was in Bosnia just last month, subhanAllah. In Sarajevo, you have the second largest cemetery of Jews in the world after some, somewhere in Israel. On the, on the tombstones, you have a language called Ladino, which is a uh, 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 which is a Spanish dialect. So how do you get lad, uh, tombstones dating back hundreds of years and on a, on a language of, of, uh, of a Spanish dialect or in a landscape of Bosnia? Well, what's the connection? It's because when they were expelled by the Christians, the Catholics, as were the Muslims, the Muslims of Bosnia, of Kosovo, the Ottomani Khilafah invited them to save them. And they came en masse to Bosnia, and hence why you have Ladino on the tombstones in the cemeteries in Sarajevo, for example. And the same is true, of course, in the Crusade. In the Crusades, when the first Crusade happened, you had the Crusaders expelled the Jews. When Salah Hadin recaptured Al Quds, he invited Jews back in. In Spain, in Spain, in Al Andalus, for example, when Tariq bin Ziyad, Muslim bin Sergei, 711, uh, you had the Fourth Council of Toledo decades before when the Jews were expelled and the Jews were forced baptism and forced conversion and forced circumcision, all these things, forced conversion, sorry, forced baptism for, and, and expelled from the lands. But when the Muslims came in, they uh, they stopped that. In fact, more than that, they made the Jews, you know, uh, prosperous in the land. Hastai bin Shaprut was the, was the wazir was a diplomat around Abdul Rahman III, who was the Khalif of, of al -Andalus. And that was his second-hand man. You have Maimonides, called the second Moses, who was the physician of Salah Hadin. He lived in Al-Andalus. So you have so many. And by the way, we, we should not forget, in our contemporary history, a very good book by Robert Satloff called Righteous Among the Nations, I think it's called Righteous Among, Righteous Among the Arabs, uh, about the accounts of Arab Muslims who saved the lives of Jews in the Holocaust. So many accounts like that. The Imam of, 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 of Paris, the Masjid, who hid Jewish children in the cellar and disguised them as Muslims and taught them Quran and to, to pretend to the Nazis perhaps that they're, they're Muslims. You know, you have the accounts of North Africa. Albania, you had the visa code. In Albania, uh, you had the Jews who were living there. But when the Nazis invaded Albania, they forced the, the, the Jews to go to the, the countryside because the, the capital was dangerous. And in the countryside, they saved the lives of so many Jews. And they said it because of this code of the visa, which is to keep the trust. That is an Islamic code. The keeping the trust is an Islamic code of doing unto others, uh, you know, what you wouldn't like done to yourself. That's an Islamic ethic. 
The idea that saving life, Allah in the Quran says, is like saving the lives of all humanity. That's not just true with the Jews, but also in my, my last chapter in my book on the human, has a chapter on Rwanda. And I look at Rwanda as this kind of a pivotal moment for Muslims to think deeply about in terms of what dawah truly means. Because 1994, when a genocide happened in Rwanda, Muslims saved the lives of countless Christians. They hid them in their homes. They gave them hijabs to wear to disguise them. They gave them rosary beads, tasbihs, you know, uh, to, to, to disguise them as Muslims. And so when the genocide came to an end, the new Rwandan president said that God sent us Muslims to teach Rwanda, Rwandans how to live. We had an amazing sense of, of a storytelling about how Muslims acted out when, when Jews were persecuted, when Christians were persecuted. And I think that is something of pride for the Muslims. We should always uh, retell those stories. So Jews have nothing to fear from a liberated Palestine? No, they should be looking forward to that because it means that Muslims would not mistreat Jews. And by the way, we're speaking about not occupiers. Occupiers who came and, and stole land have to, of course, return the land that they've stolen from people. That's only, that's only fair and makes sense. But if you think about, for example, Jews who came before 1948, there was a time when uh, you know, Arabs, even Palestinians, welcomed Jews as refugees because they were persecuted. They came as refugees. They came as people who were downtrodden, needed a place to stay, and Muslims invited them in the land. But then you had these Ashkenazi Jews who came from Europe, and they had other places, and they came and they and they stole land, and they took land from the Muslims, and these are the ones that you know, we would say that you know go back uh, because you're stealing someone else's land. And that land belongs. And of course, now you have no right of return for all the Palestinian refugees in, in, in Palestine, so in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, who, are, who have no right of return back to their homeland. Um, you know, I, I have friends who have, one of my friends is from uh, uh, one of the, the na major cities of, of, of Israel now, for example. And, uh, and I look upon his face and, and in his feeling is like, well, that's where I, I lived before. Whereas if you look at the way the Muslims treated, let's say, even uh, Holy Sepulchre, the, the, the church of the, of the Christians, uh, until today you have Muslims who hold the keys to that church to prevent the Christians because you have multiple masses in the morning of the Syriacs and the Coptics and you have different church denominations. And to prevent them having a brawl and in fighting, uh, Muslims keep the keys to that church to open and close that church every single day for the Christians. Therefore, Muslims believe in the importance of living lives of righteousness and justice for all people and not to subjugate for people just on account of their religion. So I think that Jews have 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 been uh, have had a good kind of a well time uh, and, and many not not to say that this was utopian for them. It was not, nor do we expect that for many human society. But through and through Muslims, uh, you know, the Jews had their golden age under Islam as opposed to having a golden age under Christianity, for example, or, or in their own, uh, on their own time. So there you have it. The dismantling of the last remaining European colony in the Middle East is inevitable, but it doesn't have to be violent. Will it be replaced by an equally oppressive ethno-nationalist state? That's a possibility, but not if it's liberated by people who are God conscious and following the clear and unambiguous model of Islam for governing and protecting diverse peoples. After all, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used very stern and serious warnings for those who harm or kill non-Muslims in lands ruled by Islam. He referred to those non-Muslims as dhimmatullahi wa dhimmatul rasuli, under the civil protection of Allah and his messenger. If one kills them, he will not smell paradise. If one oppresses them, I will argue against him on the day of judgment. Let's contrast that with modernity, the white supremacist, racist, and neo-colonial regimes that are supporting the status quo, which has only created more fear and stress for Jewish and non-Jewish victims of Zionism. Do Jews need to fear a liberated Palestine? Not if we all pray and work for it to be returned to the protection of the Muslims who follow their 1200 year old tried and tested model for peaceful coexistence. That is how Palestinian liberation and Jewish liberation can both be achieved. Check out this video for what you can do right now for your brothers and sisters in Palestine.